Well, it looks like we still have folks coming in, but um, I have a few remarks, so I'll go ahead and get started. They won't miss anything if they're just joining us. Welcome everyone <clears throat> to a conversation about book arts with Brad Freeman. I'm Kim Norman, Director of Preservation and Digitization Services for Emory Libraries at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Here, our department digitizes and conserves library collection material, including artist books from the Stuart A. Rose Manuscript Archives and Rare Book Library, where the Nexus Press Archive also resides. The presentation tonight is co-sponsored by the generous support of Emory Libraries and the Guild of Book Workers Southeast Chapter, of which I'm the chair. But before I begin, I have a few housekeeping notes. Um, Brad's talk will be 45 minutes long or so, followed by a moderated Q&A session with Lori Spencer. Please remember to mute your microphones throughout the event. And during the Q&A, you may use the Zoom reaction button at the bottom of your screen to raise your hand and then unmute with a question. We are recording this event and we'll make it available soon. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator this evening, Lori Spencer. For two decades, Lori was the master printer in the Borofsky Center for Publication Arts at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. There, she worked with countless artists to produce artist books and offset lithography prints. Lori received her BFA from the State University of New York at Purchase and her MFA in Book Arts and Printmaking from the University of the Arts, where she is currently Director of the Book Arts and Printmaking Graduate Program. Please join me in welcoming my friend and colleague, Lori Spencer. Thanks, Kim. Uh, I met Brad Freeman when we were both graduate students in the Book Arts and Printmaking program at the University of the Arts. I've always assumed the same thing brought us both to that program. And that was a new and very sweet Heidelberg Coors Offset Press. Brad's work is photographically based. He uses offset to both translate the photographic image into the multiple and to build up mark in the space of the photographic image. Brad's use of the press is like a painter's use of a brush. It's an extension of his self. That's a description um, of the use of a press as uh, an art making tool by Eugene Feldman, grandfather of uh, offset. Unlike a paintbrush though, the press produces multiples, which along with the photographic image and the book is the center of Brad Freeman's practice. Brad has produced over 25 artist books and those books are in special collections around the world. Just to name a few, the Brooklyn Museum, the Hague Museum in the Netherlands, the Museum of Modern Arts Franklin Furnished Archives, the Ruth and Mar Marvin Sackner Archives for Visual and Concrete Poetry and the Victoria and Albert Museum, and the list goes on. Uh, Brad's use of the offset press and the book format didn't stay contained to artworks. He used his access to presses to produce the Journal of Artist Books, known to us as JAB, from 1994 to 2020. Brad was the editor, designer, and printer of JAB, which opened up the critical conversation around artist books. He printed issues of JAB at Soho Services, SUNY Purchase, the University of the Arts, but the bulk of the issues were printed at Nexus Press in Atlanta, and more recently at Columbia College in Chicago, where Brad was the studio coordinator at the Center for Book and Paper. Brad Freeman has spoken about his work as a book artist and as an editor, as the editor of JAB at multiple College of Book Arts Association conferences at the New York Art Book Fair, at San Francisco Center for the Book, and the list goes on there as well. He was the keynote speaker at both the Artist Book Bisbon event in 2015 at Queensland College of Art in Bisbon, Australia, and the perspectives of the Artist Book Conference in 2009 at Federal University of Minas Gerais uh, at Belo Horizonte, Brazil, excuse my uh, pronunciation there. Um, as well as being a keynote speaker at the Craft Culture Critique, Critique Conference in 2004 at the University of Iowa. In 2018, Brad was honored by the Center for Book Arts in New York for his work on JAB. And in 2022, uh, the American Printing History Association awarded Brad the Individual Laureate Award. I'd like to thank Kim Norman for creating this platform tonight 
uh, to acknowledge Brad Freeman's contributions to the book arts field. Uh, the fact that it's an Atlanta-based platform is a not, as a nod seems um, appropriate given Brad's contributions um, to Nexus Press. Uh, as Kim mentioned, uh, there'll be a Q&A at the end. You can raise your Zoom hand, or if you prefer to uh, type your questions in the chat, we'll monitor the chat as well. So thanks for joining us tonight. It's good to see um, so many familiar names and faces, and I'll turn it over to Brad. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Lori. I appreciate that. Um, are we just going to go right into the um, slideshow, Kim? Sure, yeah. I'm ready if you are. Okay. Yeah, let's just go ahead with that. And then I'll just signal you each time we need a new slide. Perfect. This talk is given on the occasion of the donation of Ruth Laxon's artist book collection to the Rose Library at Emory University. The collection consists of approximately 108 artist books collected by Ruth Laxon and includes many books published by Atlanta's Nexus Press and other important independent publishers. The books represent a significant addition to the vibrant artist book holdings in Rose Library. Ruth was a good friend of mine. And one day she told me that she had willed her artist book collection to me. I decided to donate the collection to the Rose Library for a number of reasons, one of them being the Rose Library's dealing with artist books already. They have a really great collection, plus the Nexus archive. But Ruth was a longtime resident of Atlanta and was active in the Atlanta art scene. And I think she would have been happy that her collection was close to the Nexus Press archive, which is also held at Rose. The books on this cart, as you see, are the inventoried artist book collection that belonged to Ruth, ready to transfer to Rose Library. This talk will be a journey through some specific parts of human activity that constitute culture creation. Culture creation is an ongoing process with the library as a point in the process and the safe repository of books that contribute to defining culture. But there is no end yet to the process. One of my hopes is that scholars and students will use the Rose Library to examine and write critically about artist books. Obviously, people are the driving force in this process. And so I'd like to thank Kim Norman again, who was instrumental in bringing Ruth's collection to the library and making this event tonight. I'd also like to thank Randy Gu, the director of the Rose Library Special Collections for his vision of including artist books as an integral part of the library. And I'd like to thank Robin Robton Davis, Ruth's niece, for her work as the executor of Ruth's estate. Tonight, I'll talk about three intertwined things. I'll talk about two of Ruth Laxon's artist books, both printed at Nexus Press. I'll talk about JAB, the Journal of Artist Books, which I founded in 1994. And finally, I'll talk about two of my artist books. And Nexus Press will be weaving in and out of this presentation. Next. I had the pleasure of knowing Ruth Laxon as an artist, friend, and collaborator. Joanne Paschal of Nexus Press introduced Johanna Drucker and me to Ruth and Patty Bell Hastings in 1992, while Johanna and I were on a residency at Nexus Press. And Michael Goodman, then the director of Nexus Press, was printing our collaborative artist book, Other Space, Martian Typography. Five years later, Patty Bell interviewed Ruth for Jab 8 in 1997. The photo here is by Lori Whitehill, who was the librarian at RISD. She was able to get Ruth's archive for RISD. And this would be another great source for scholars interested in writing about artist books. Get it? There should be more writing about artist books. Next. This is Ruth in her studio, plus garden, gardens are near Edens, dare rage near edge. Ruth was interested in anagrams. It was part of her playful yet serious attitude toward art and language. 
This anagram was a sculpture in Ruth's garden in the shape of a book, showing her dedication and love of the book form. Next. HO plus go squared equals it. On the left, the cover closed. And on the right, the inside front cover plus page one. Ruth's art was often somewhat esoteric and thus is ripe for speculative interpretation. The title declares an emphatic but mysterious ho plus go squared equals it. For me, the meaning of the title was elusive until I looked at the first two turns, pages two through five. The images and language on those pages, which we'll look at in a moment, made me think that Ruth was depicting the beginning of the universe, the big bang. Chaos was exploding out before things began to coalesce. Something written as ho, H-O, combines with or is sparked by go, then squared and becomes it. It is the universe, that's my reading. Artist books are a way of getting readers accustomed to reading and writing, reading and viewing in new ways. And Ruth's books are a great example of this. I'd like to give a little bit of background about the printing of the book. HO plus GO, which I'm gonna call it from now on, was offset printed at Nexus Press by Clifton Matter in 1986. At the time, Cliff was the director of Nexus. He had seen Ruth's work in a gallery in Atlanta. Ruth had made an installation and was doing sound poetry. According to Cliff, the installation had a narrative structure and seemed to be time-based. Because of this, he thought the book had a book like he thought the work had a book-like quality and invited Ruth to come to Nexus Press and make a book. HO plus Go was the result. At Nexus Press, Ruth drew and painted on mylar sheets on a light table to make all the images. These sheets were exposed to positive plates for the press. While she was drawing, she made vocalizations that Cliff believes were echoes of her drawings and or vice versa. So let's examine the cover and the inside cover plus page one. On the left, the front cover, which is not as wide as the text block or the back cover. So looking at the front cover of the book, you can actually see part of page one. A directional signal in the form of a triangle points to the title, HO plus go, and the way into the book. On the right, the inside front cover and page one. Page one is the title page plus part of the cover. Let's consider the marks and little drawings on this spread. First, the little squiggly marks, blue at the top above the title bar and red below the title bar. And the sharp wedge-like marks, red at the top above the title bar and blue below. The switching of colors adds a visually dynamic quality to the spread, which is anchored by the title bar running the full horizontal length of the spread. The squiggly marks, marks and wedge-like marks could be associated with freewheeling atoms or neutrinos at the beginning of the universe, at the beginning of the book. They are shapes, marks, without symbolic meaning. On the title page, the squiggly marks seem to coalesce to form hieroglyph-like drawings, sharp little figures. The one on the far right holding up an arm to stop the title, to separate the title from the tiny human stick figures. Can we begin to attach meaning to these figures or are they still in the formative stage? Next. This is the first turn of HO plus Go, page two and three. The colors link the two pages together while the falling, while the falling figure on the left page pulls the eye to the left we tend to look at the human figure. The spare line drawing depicts a not completely formed falling human. There is no face and it's androgynous. On the right, two overlapping sphere-like force fields collide or is one field, force field just splitting. There are all sorts of almost decipherable words, lines, marks, all jumbled up in the lower half of the field. Next. 
The falling figure is immersed within a cosmos of various star-like and incoherent glyphs, numbers, and symbols. I see this as a representation of the moments right after the Big Bang, moments after the beginning of the universe, and appropriately, again, at the beginning of the book. Next. This page has two directional signals that point in the way that the book goes. The three footsteps in the center and the blue triangle on the lower right indicate the direction of the movement of the book from front to back. These are indications of Ruth's understanding of making art in the book form. One page follows another in a time-based sequence. Language is beginning to cohere. We can see an uppercase N and above this are the words up, 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 and some numbers. At the bottom center in blue, which is kind of hard to read, says full speed and US next to a dollar sign. An American flag stresses the relationship between our nation and the overimportance of money. Next. This is a detail of that one. It's a suicide mission. A tiny figure steering the US rocket at full speed through space into what? Stars refer to the universe again and establish the relationship of we insignificant humans within the universe. But as a species, we are of course doomed and we are doomed by our own doing. The cartoon-like rendering adds an ironic and humorous quality to the image. Next. This is the second turn, pages four and five. Visually, the two pages of the spread are linked together by the abstracted gray clouds at the top. On the verso, the left side of the spread, there is, there is language symbolic of chaos at the top of the triangular tablet-like object. Ho, go, got end, g, g, plus more glyphs. Then the language again begins to cohere with phrases and lists of important people who must have influenced Ruth. Quote, and in the beginning, peaceful solution, howl ye, howl. Does this refer to Allen Ginsberg's epic poem, Howl? William Blake, Leonardo, most enduring, tell me una voce. Bessie Smith, Hieronymus Bosch, most highly earnest, Lao Tzu, Jesus Christ. Next. This is the right side of the second turn, page five. The language of consumerism. Quote, today, 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 only 2298 while it lasts. Who's your leader? 40% off. Most, 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 most. Goods, 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 goods. Repeated over and over like the constant barrage of advertisements in our public and private environments. In the center, there's a drawing of a face, mouth wide open with dollar signs around one eye. Next. This is Ruth at Nexus Press during the printing of her artist book, A Hundred Years of Lex Flex uh, from 2003. I had the honor of printing Lex Flex and working with Ruth on this project. Lex Flex was the last book printed at Nexus Press before being closed by the Atlantic Contemporary Art Center. And she's looking at a press sheet right there. And in the background, you can see uh, some of the stacks of the already printed sheets. Next, this is the cover of 100 Years of Lex Flex. It's case bound, 54 pages, eight and a half by 11, closed. Lex Flex, a lexicon that is flexible, referring to the mutability of language when new words come into our vocabulary. The meaning of, book, of the book is indicated in the title. It is a book about new words in the English language during the 20th century. Next. On the first page spread, oh, this is the end sheet in page one. On the first page spread, circular shapes mirror each other across the, gu the gutter. On the recto, the wobbly rounded shape of a clock with the numbers 1900 and 2000 repeat the 100, the 100 years and the theme of time on the book's title. On the verso, on the left, fading secret misunderstood messages from the past 
on the end sheet are printed in silver ink. Maybe LexFlex has a clarity of design and purpose that differs from HO plus Go. Whereas HO plus Go bursts with an almost chaotic energy, the design of LexFlex seems more deliberate and comprehensible. Next. Part one, this is uh, page two and three. The circle of various objects around the handwritten part one repeats the circle of the clock on page one. The objects are part of the early 20th century. Microscopic drawings of tiny organisms, industrial pulleys, sailing ship, steam engine, etc. At the very top of the page, we find the tiny word Pluto because the planet Pluto was discovered in 1930. Page two is blank, which is another difference from HO plus Go, which had no blank pages. Next. She pris around and primp. He zooty, love one another. Handwritten on wood grain background, it really reminds me of the South, the rural South. The word pris was attested as a noun in 1923. In this case, Ruth uses pris as a verb. The definition of a pris as a noun is a spoiled person who thinks they are too good for everyone. Primp, to dress or groom oneself with elaborate care. Zooty, a man wearing a zoot suit. Page five is laid out in three distinct columns. The two outside columns contain the years certain things occurred, including 1903, Wilbur and Orville Wright fly an airplane at Kitty Hawk. 1913, x-ray discovered. 1928, penicillin discovered. The inside column has a running history laced with irony. Quote, it was the early 1900s and the young century was humming. It marched through World War I. Autos and cameras emerged and women in the USA won the right to vote in 1920. It was the carefree, carefree dancing, roaring 20s. Anyone for tennis? And to this utopia came the great American crash, AKA panic plus depression and, 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 and all around the land, Bob Hare and Charleston were fixing to crash too. Next. Um, on the right side, the center column contains a list of events and personalities of the early 20th century, early to mid 20th century. Quote, let us now praise famous men infused to poverty with poetry and dignity, end quote. Ruth makes a case for the study of history. We must examine the past in order to attempt to avoid the mistakes of the past. Let us now praise famous men, documents a place and a time, and is the well-known book with photographs by Walker Evans and texts by James Agee, that unflinchingly showed the abject poverty of three white sharecropper families in the South. Below that, Annie Besant founded the Indian Home Rule League. Annie Besant was a British socialist, a theosophist, women's rights activist, writer, orator, educator, and philanthropist. Next. On the left, a robed figure with a slice across its neck holds a tiny candle up against the facing page made up of a bloody red overlay on stark high contrast photographs showing some of the horrors of World War II. Hitler, concentration camp victims, tanks, enthusiastic Hitler youth saluting the Fuhrer. Next. The civil rights movement is mentioned in the text on the left page, quote, while the work and attitudes of Martin Luther King brought hope to the struggle, end quote. On the recto, new words are listed with their dates of attestation. Desegregate, 55. The Birchist, 62. The John Birch Society, we must remember that in the US, radical white nationalist groups have been active for the last 150 years. This does not count the 300 or so years 
of slavery in the antebellum South. Social, ju ju social justice comments by Ruth abound throughout Lex Flex. Next. We're gonna segue now into Jab. Um, while we were printing the Lex Flex, I asked Ruth if she would design the cover plus inside cover for Jab 20, and she did. The year was 2003. The text and images on the cover allude to the ri rising tensions in the Middle East between radical jihadists and some in the US wanting revenge for the 9-11 attacks. This eventually resulted in George Bush's war in Iraq. We thought it really couldn't happen, but it did. Ruth wrote on the back cover, quote, the chieftains were restless, fear of demon difference, end quote. So the cover is a political statement. A woman wears a burqa, cars implying oil, and thus alluding to the Middle East. And on the left, near the spine in vertical, it is up to us if we go on as it is. This is Ruth's call to action and protest with two letter words. Next. I founded JAB, the Journal of Artist Books in 1994 to provide a forum for critical inquiry into artist books. JAB was a collaborative effort with 48 issues produced. Over 400 writers, artists, and students were involved. Johanna Drucker has been closely involved with JAB from the very beginning, writing essays, providing editorial direction, et cetera. Johanna and I are putting together a JAB anthology that will be published by the University of Iowa Press next year. The anthology will contain 25 of the best essays published over the years in JAB. Print production and, ex and an exploration of the possibilities of graphic design within the form of the book were always an important part of JAB. Cliff Matter's JAB 4 cover, can't miss it, it's on the top row, he, which, he letter, which he letterpress printed at Hat Show Print in Nashville, initiated another important part of JAB, the covers. The covers were either designed by invited art, book artists or me and printed offset or designed in letterpress printed by invited artists who are also letterpress printers. Next. This slide shows me training Chad Latz on the Heidelberg cord while we print Jab 2 at Nexus Press in Atlanta in 1994. I agreed, to I agreed to train Chad in exchange for use of the press. Jab 2 contains an essay by Johanna Drucker, The Public Life of Artist Books, Questions of Identity, and an essay by Michael Casper titled Calendar Art, Scenes from the Life of Raja Ravi Karma. I edited, designed, and printed most of the jab, jabs at various shops and colleges where I worked. Lori named these, but I'll name them again. Soho Services in New York City, Nexus Press, the Borofsky Center at the University of the Arts, SUNY Purchase, and the Center for Book and Paper at Columbia College, Chicago. Next. These are the JAB 21 through JAB 47, 48 covers. All but five of these covers were printed offset and or letterpress at the Center for Book and Paper. However, the cover for JAB 22 was designed and letterpress printed by Elizabeth Long at her Chicago studio. The cover for JAB 26 was designed and letterpress printed by Mary Jo Polly at her Jordan, Minnesota studio. The cover of JAB 28 was silkscreen printed by Sonnen Zimmer in Chicago, and JAB 39 cover was printed by Polymer Letterpress by Gwen Harrison, Sue Anderson, and Nick Summers in Sydney, Australia. JAB had an international presence with special issues about artist books from Brazil, Portugal, Poland, France, and Australia. Next. I was the studio coordinator and I taught artist book and print production classes and produced JAB at CBPA from 2006 to 2021. 
There was an MFA book and paper program at CBPA. Next. Mary Claire Butler and Woody Leslie were graduate students in the MFA book and paper program. They were also print production fellows working under my supervision in the production of JAB, as well as their own artist books. They learned the entire offset process, including setting up files for image setting, image setting film, plate making, running the Heidelberg GTO press, and how to prepare sheets for the bindery. They also participated in the graphic design and in writing reviews of books received. Next. This is Woody and Mary Claire in post-production. You can see part of our bindery in the back there. Woody and Mary Claire, they're inserting my artist book titled Book of Ruth about a visit with Ruth Laxon in her studio into the already bound Jab 36, which was a special issue on artists and their studios. Next. These are artist books that were inserted into Jab 47, 48. Um, and so there's page spreads of six of the 13 artist books that were in JAB 47, 48. Um, and there's probably around 50 artist books that were inserted in the JABs over the years. Um, so we have uh, Spells to Kill Your Boss by Julia Arredondo, Four Long and Too Short by Emily McVarish, Just Saying by Matt Little, Weights and Marks by M.A. Bodoin, Outport Night by Clifton Metter, and Algavoris by Amir Brito Cador. Next. Portuguese artist Isabel Badaona, Arms Akimbo in the Solid Blue Shirt, was a jab artist in residence. She's working with Kate Morgan, another print production fellow printing wood and metal cuts from the CBPA collection for Isabel's artist book titled Excerpts from Song of Myself by Walt Whitman. This was inserted into Jab 43. Also, Isabel, along with Catarina Cardozo, edited Jab 39, the Portuguese jab. At the center, there are six Vandercooks, three uni ones and three number fours. There's lots of metal and wood type and a vast collection of cuts. Next. This slide shows the cover and a couple of page spreads from Isabel Baraona's artist book, Excerpts from Song of Myself. The wood and metal cuts that Kate and Isabel were letterpress printing in the previous slide were scanned, then offset printed in spot colors on top of the images of maps. Next. This is Jenna Rodriguez printing another PPF. She's printing on the, the Heidelberg. Uh, she's actually printing another book by um, Isabel. On the upper left uh, is the delivery and it's just the cyan that's been printed. And in the middle, uh, upper middle is the delivery. Uh, and she's pulling a sheet out. So it's a one person press. And on the right, she's upper, she's checking the registration. Lower right, she's checking the registration in the middle, she's checking the registration. And on the left, she's making a, an adjustment on the side guide. Uh, Jenna owns and operates um, an organic farm on the Delmarva Peninsula now. Next. The top image shows Claire Sammons, another PPF designing Jab 33 on a laptop in our bindery. The bottom four images show Claire making plates in the dark room. On the far left, she is punching a plate using the three hole self-centering punch for tight registration and then exposing and developing a plate. Next. Now we're gonna shift. Um, I'll talk about two of my own books, actually three, two versions of Lake House, which we see here. The first version on the left from 1980, um, and this was my first artist book. On the right is the second version, which I printed in 2016. After that, I'll finish with some slides of my most recent book, We Too, which I completed last year. The Lake House was a group home for nine developmentally challenged adults in Tallahassee. I worked there as a live-in house counselor, and I previously had worked at a large institution called Sunland, 
where the residents of the lake house had lived prior to its opening. I remade Lake House for a couple of reasons. I often think of it as my best book. And in 2016, I had access to far better printing equipment. The images would look so much better with more detail, thus rendered closer to their original black and white photos. On the cover of the 2016 version is a photo of Penny, our housekeeper. For no nonsense, Penny, you see her clenched fist on the right. Next. Gloria Jean on the left and Gloria Jean and Maddie on the right. I wanted to give a glimpse into the lives of people who tend to be forgotten or ignored by society at large. I wanted to present the residents of Lake House as people with lives, desires and needs, no different from other people, except that they are physically challenged and require a special living situation. Next. This is Walter jogging. After I received phone calls from people saying that one of our quote, inmates was trying to escape, Walter had a t-shirt made with I am jogging printed on the front. The text tells the story of how Walter bet me that he could wheel by himself from downtown Tallahassee where he worked to the lake house, a trip of about two miles up and down hills on sidewalks but having to cross roads sometimes without traffic lights. He made it, but required a little help because of the, a lot of the intersections were not wheelchair accessible. I showed Lake House to my grandmother and described it as an artist book. She said, it's not art, it's sociology. And she was right. Next. This is Walter at work in downtown Tallahassee across the street from the Florida State Capitol building. Each Lake House resident was required to have a job. Next. Mike, also known as Bones, a nickname given to him by Walter. Um, Walter was really good at uh, giving nicknames that were very appropriate to people. On the left, Mike is transferring from his wheelchair. Mike asked me to take photos of him transferring so he could send them to his parents. Being able to transfer from a wheelchair to another chair or a shower chair and bed were requirements for the lake house residents. In the text, Mike talks about how he is trapped in his body that doesn't work properly and how despairing this is for him. Next. On the verso is Sunland where they used to live. And on the recto, it's Mike at Cape Sandblast at the Gulf of Mexico in the Florida Panhandle. There was a wheelchair accessible house owned by the state and available to wards of the state. Next. This is Martha and she's helping Nellie with her laundry, which she's not supposed to do, but sometimes I was lax in the rules. Next. Production versus reproduction. Lori talked about this a little bit. The, the critical aspect of my approach to printing on an offset press centers around the idea of production versus reproduction. Rather than reproducing images that previously exist, I often use the press as a tool for producing or creating images. In other words, using offset as a creative printmaking medium. On the right, the cover of Lake House is, is an example of reproduction, where I'm trying to render the tritone offset printed image as close as possible to the original black and white photograph. On the left, the cover of my latest artist book, We Too, is an example of production, where I'm creating an image that did not previously exist by using the offset process and overprinting black on black and metallic inks with digital images, et cetera. Next. Again, the cover of We Too, 2021. 68 pages, case bound, 11 and three quarters by eight and three quarters. And it has two inserted books. The cover is based on a photo of, of a Rose of Sharon in my backyard in Chicago. 
The spark or impetus for We Too came about after the convergence of two events. Number one, I inherited thousands of slides my dad had taken during his travels while he was in the army from 1953 to 1974. And number two, the reconnecting with a close friend and collaborator after a number of years apart. The conceptual structure of We Too consists of various page to page sequences, interventions, ruptures, recapitulations and associations that hopefully convey some of my views about the world and the bookness of the book. Next. This is a We Too, the inside front cover and page one. I wrote, the fo I wrote the following introductory text, which was inspired by the Song of Solomon. I will show you the ocean and the shore and the Rose of Sharon and the time we had and the places we met. Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. I will show you the photographs he took and the places he went and the people he saw, but not what he thought. Let me touch your hand. Let me hear your song. Next. These are paratroopers, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, around 1954. The photo is by my dad, Tom Freeman, while, uh, while out on a walk with me. I was about three and a half or so. And then I wrote on here, it's an attempt as a document with metaphoric possibilities to see it, view it from our hardened bubbles. Next. That is exuberant me in Fort Sill on that walk with some uh, digital hanky panky going on and funny printing. Um, next. Bath Spa UK, Armistice Day Parade, commemorating the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I, 2018. I took these photos while on an artist residency at Bath Spa University. Growing up in the military has made me aware of military culture. Next. Korea, Japan, 1963. It's an inserted 24 page book sewn into the binding of We Too between the first and second signatures. The book has photos taken by my dad, arranged by me, and thus a post-mortem collaboration between us. Next. This is a page spread from Korea, Japan, 1963. My dad visited the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum, which is dedicated to documenting the atomic bombing of Hiroshima in World War II. Quote, so that was how Hiroshima perished in the disastrous explosion. Men and women, young and old, for the souls of the fallen victims, let us pray. Rest in peace. Next. On the left, LA from the Getty Museum. On the right, London and the Thames River from the eye. This last part of We Too alludes to extinction events and our disastrous complicity. Next. New Haven, the Peabody Museum of Natural History with the very famous Rudolf Salinger mural, misnamed Age of Reptiles. So the dinosaurs are looking one direction, we're looking the other direction, but we're going the same place. Next. On the left at the Peabody Museum, a fossilized extinction event. And on the right, a viewer looking at a Mosasaur fossil. The mosasaurs, which were marine reptiles, became extinct as a result of the KPG extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous period, 66 million years ago. Think back to Ruth Laxon's 100 years of Lex Flex and how rapidly human culture changes and wonder how long it will last. But this is our time and we are here now. Next. Thank you. That's the end. <laughs> Thank you, Brad. You're welcome. <laughs> so I, I thought it was interesting that um, you sort of bookended your talk with uh, 
Ruth's book, Hope Plus Go, which is all about sort of the, the birth of um, creation, whatever, and ended it with uh, your book, which is all about extinction. Um, that's not really a question there, but an interesting, um, you know. I think now is a really pertinent time to think about those kinds of things, obviously. Um, you know, right now in Ukraine, I mean, there's the chance of atomic war, who knows? Um, and the climate situation um, uh, is getting worse and it's accelerating. Um, those are facts. Mm -hmm. so. Hard to avoid it. Yep. Um, so one question I have, you know, I've always sort of thought of jab functioning on two planes, I guess, you know, as a, as a, like the production of jab and, and the sort of creativity that went into the production of jab um, on one plane. And then the, um, the critical context um, on a, on a sort of another plane. Can you talk a little bit about sort of how you think of jab? Um, I don't know, a couple of years after you haven't been doing it for a while? Well, um, like I said, it, it was really a collaborative process uh, or project. I'm not a scholar. I don't consider myself a writer, um, but I understood that artist books needed more attention um, with serious writing. Um, so there's that aspect of it. And then eventually there's all these artist books that were put into it. I can't remember which was the first. Um, it might've been at Nexus Press with Jab 17. Anyway, um, that is really where my sort of expertise is. If I do have an expertise is, you know, artist books or artist books, the actual objects. And I really wanted to sort of um, put our money where our mouth was and show these books that I thought, well, with the books, what I did was I would invite people, but I wouldn't curate their books. I would invite people whose work I liked and figured that they were going to come up with something. So I don't know if that answers the question or not, but. Yeah, well, so, so I think that's definitely um, you as a collaborator really um, using Jab as a platform for that, which I've never really thought of um, in that way before. Yeah, um, in some ways a collaborator, in another way as a facilitator, mm -hmm. um, like with the covers as well, I didn't curate those either, other than to ask people whose work I liked, you know, that I, I figured, you know, they would come up with something and they would, you know, come up with something. I often looked at it at first and thought, oh man, I don't really like that. But then I could under, begin to understand it. And I think that was part of the, the joy was to um, really looking at something and seeing something that's surprising and at first unfamiliar, and then starting to understand what the artist was doing. But in those cases, I was a facilitator for their work. I wasn't collaborating as such in that sense. Maybe it's a fine distinction. Mm -hmm. Attitude, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's um, one comment and one question in the chat. I'm just gonna, uh, I'll read the comment. Uh, wonder, wonderful tribute to Rose Laxton and Brad's father and the value of doing things over and over again. Loved jab, thank you. Uh, that's from Claudia Hollander. Uh, and then uh, Bridget McGraw has a question. Since GBW standards will be in Atlanta in October, is there a special visit to this archives in the program? I don't know if that's directed that's for to Kim. Kim? Yeah. Uh, it could be for me or Jennifer Pilecchia, who's also in this meeting. I think the program for standards is developing. Jennifer? I and I would say that it, it is certainly one of our goals to provide that, but um, we will put all of the info when it is, um, when the planning is complete in the next issue of the newsletter, which will be out in June. So we'll know by then. 
Thanks. So um, again, feel free to raise your hand if you have questions or uh, type a question into the chat. Uh, in the meantime, Brad, maybe I'll ask you just to um, talk a little bit about, I don't know, production, right? Because I don't know, that's something I think about a lot now. Um, given the fact that we're so uh, steeped in the digital age um, at this point. So um, I don't know, the, um, do you have any thoughts on production and the value of production, the value of um, mechanical over digital in terms of, um, I don't know, the making well, of artist books or whatever. Yeah, I was, um, I started uh, printing a long, long time ago, um, like in the middle 70s. And um, so I went through the whole photo mechanical and digital and then digital revolution. So for me personally, I'm able to sort of use those different techniques depending on what was in my mind what I wanted to produce. You know, in some ways it would be easier and um, different if you did it photomechanically rather than digitally. But I think and, uh, something I was thinking about um, when you were asking the question was, and I think about the print production fellows and specifically Jenna Rodriguez, who learned how to run the press and she might've been arguably the best printer that we had. Um, and now she has letter presses and she wants to start a studio with an artist residency program, but she also owns and operates an organic farm. So the idea of working on something for a while and becoming expert at it, it doesn't really matter what it is. I think you can take that sort of work ethic and things that you've learned, you know, doing that, whatever it was, into almost any other field. I think it's, it's, it's easy in some ways to do that, mm -hmm. maybe. It wasn't in my case though. I did the same thing for my entire career. <laughs> um, anyway. <laughs> so uh, Aaron has a question. I, I know, there's a typo in there, so I'm gonna to have to just read the question and see. I know Lake House is what you consider your first artist book. Can you describe how you got involved with uh, artist books? Um, and then she says, Joe with a question mark and Kim asks a similar question. If you can uh, talk a little bit about your mentor, um, Joe, and how he used the press and his influence. Yeah. Um... Hi, Aaron. <laughs> uh, good to know your presence. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, how I got interested in artist books. When I was an undergraduate, I was um, doing photography and printmaking for the most part. And in photo at that time, we were looking at, at books. All the pho photographs were appearing in books. And I bought a Dwayne Michaels book in around 1972 at a regular bookstore. Uh, it's called Take One and See Mount Fujiyama. I don't know if you all are familiar with that or not, but Dwayne Michaels was a photographer and he also made books. Um, but anyway, so looking at photographs in books and something like The Americans by Robert Frank, which was one of my favorite books back then still is, Robert Frank, took a lot of photographs, black and white photographs um, across the United States in the early 60s, or no, actually in the 50s, uh, because Jack Kerouac did the introduction um, for the first um, edition. Anyway, Robert Frank had everything to do with the editing of that book, because he understood that one photograph will influence the, uh, another photograph in the mind of the viewer. So there's these associations that occur from page to page that are really important. Um, and so those kinds of things sort of made me want to 
want to make books. And then I met this guy named Joe Ruther, whom my photo professor, uh, Robert Fichter, introduced me to. Um, and Joe Ruther, actually, after I got my undergraduate degree, I went to a vocational school where Joe was teaching offset printing and photography um, because I wanted to learn how to do it. Um, and eventually, uh, I bought one of Joe's presses. He had five presses. He would keep uh, three of them for, you know, cannibalizing for parts. Anyway, Joe is making these funny little books and doing them with offset. And offset was the closest to photography, which was a lot of my background. Um, and so that's what happened, that combination of photography and artist books. Um, that's my answer. <laughs> so did Joe use the press um, as a paintbrush? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, the, t the talk that I gave for um, AFA, um, I, 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 I show a photograph of Joe printing, uh, just a regular black and white photo that I took, and then another rendition of it that's really based upon how he was working that I made. So I was watching how he was working, um, manipulating the uh, photographic image in the dark room. Again, this was all photomechanical. Um, and then on the press itself, uh, doing, trying different things on the press um, that most printmakers are familiar with. Split fonts, um, uh, et cetera. We can ask Matt about that, maybe. <laughs> different techniques. <laughs> anyway, um, does that help? I think so. Okay. Um, so Johanna asks, uh, did you ever get to talk to Ruth about production technology and how it related to her composition process? Um, that's a really good question. Um, when I, I, um, I did not talk to her specifically about that. I mean, we did, of course, talk about production. And a lot of times it was about the possibilities of production. Um, but when, when I look at, when you look at um, uh, Ho plus Go, H-O plus Go, um, she was drawing right onto Mylar and painting right onto Mylar and making the separations. There's four colors in that book. Um, and so she would make these separations. So she understood printmaking. So in that respect, um, she probably got a lot of help from Cliff. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I haven't talked to him about that. Lori, can I ask a question since there's not another question in the chat about Ruth's work? And it, Brad, do you know if anyone has Ruth's production archive? Yeah. Um, oh, well, that's a good question. Um, like what led up to that? I mean, she was drawing on the Mylar. Her, her work is so amazing page by page. Yeah. And so like, it would be really well, interesting to yeah. know how she, did she have mock-ups? Was she transferring or was she working directly? Um, just, yeah. So does anybody have that material? Yeah, um, the, the RISD library has her archive. And um, I mentioned that in my talk, Lori Whitehill um, was the uh, librarian at the time and she was a very good friend of Ruth's. So they were able to get the archive and that would be a, another great source. I mean, it, it seems like, you know, scholars could write about uh, Ruth's work. Uh, there's a lot there, um, go up to RISD, you know, see how, what's in the archive. I don't really know what's in the archive. Um, um, Brad, you said that um, Cliff saw her work at a an, an exhibition. Um, is, was Ruth Ruth wasn't was she a printmaker? What is what is her background um, before that she entered uh, the world of artist books? Well, um, she didn't start making art until she was sixty three years old, and the name of her press was Plus sixty three. So I don't know what she did before then, but she was obviously interested in language. 
and she did do installations. And I did go to at least one of her um, exhibitions at uh, a gallery in uh, Atlanta, which were a combination of printmaking, hand drawing uh, with language and images, not very different than what she was doing in her books. Um, and she was also, um, like I mentioned, doing sound poetry. So there's this sort of sort of expansive practice that she had. Mm -hmm. you know, Her books always reminded me of um, Warren Lair's books. Uh, and, and Warren has a performance component to his work as yeah. well. Yeah. There's a few more questions in the chat. Um, Matt asks, can you talk about the collaboration between book artists and libraries? Wow. <laughs> I, uh, could, I could maybe, um, give that a little bit of direction if you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know, you, you had, um, when we talked last week, you had um, mentioned, um, what did you, culture creation. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I thought you might talk a little bit more right. about that tonight. And you did in relationship to uh, special collections, but can you, ex can you expand on that maybe? Well, again, like what I was trying to say in the in the talk was this culture creation is 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 this wide, big, long process, you know, that arguably, you know, you could say, I don't think it really has a starting point, but it does. It does and it doesn't. It does and it has an end point, but it doesn't have an end point. So it's always changing. So like let's just say Rus artist books, 108 of them, they go into the Rose special collections library. And then somebody comes and they start looking at them and they start thinking about them. If they're a scholar, they might write about them, hopefully. If they're an artist, they might be inspired by them. But the libraries being this repository of culture, in one place, you have so much. And you could just spend, you know, however long you want, you know, looking at these things. Um, the artist books. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, Matt, or not. If you want to. Yeah, I was, you know, I was just thinking about how important it is that the libraries support artist books and show them and collect them and give them, a, you know, otherwise we're just kind of crazy cranks doing these things that are like out of fashion <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, it gives us legitimacy or something to, to have these library collections, but I think there are generally people in the libraries that are interested in books and interested in what we're doing as artists exploring mm -hmm. the book and you know it's such an important thing and I, and I um, uh, you know learning about the you know taking the history of the book class at the those collections just putting them in the context of special collections and a longer cultural span I think is important. Um, it's, it's a place where we can, our work can be seen, uh, you know, shows and, and it, you know, galleries is sort of a different kind of a venue, whereas libraries give it a different context. And I don't know, it's, just, it's important for the field. And I just thought you have, would, uh, your relationships with librarians and stuff uh, would be worth talking about. Um, if my relationship with librarians is not very extensive, but I do know this, if you go to a library, if you're able to make an appointment with somebody that is collecting or is able to collect, and they actually look at your work and you explain your work to them, then they're more receptive to actually buying it. Um, and then it becomes part of their collection. And then it becomes sort of the responsibility of teachers, I think, at these different institutions if, there, if it is like a university or college, to take their students there. Um, at SAIC, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, there's five different departments that are teaching artist book classes. And so there's not one sort of like coherent, like view of what artist books should be at SAIC. And they also have the uh, Joan Flash collection of artist books, which has huge collection. And there's students up there all the time 
looking at stuff. The teachers are bringing them up there. Um, and so they understand that the students need to look at a lot of different kinds of things, a lot of different kinds of artist books. I don't know if that helps, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, it's great. I mean, you know, to find <laughs> to find, you know, somebody uh, like Randy Gu is he's he thinks that artist books are integral to his uh, special collections at the Rose Library. And so there you go. You have one person and it is culture creation is driven by people, you know, with different interests. And again, it's this process. It just never ends, you know, with the looking and the writing and the making. Mm -hmm. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> well, and the, the facilitation, right? Back to being a facilitator. Right, Maybe. right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so Amanda asks, uh, can you talk about your newest book, specifically the pre-press process, digital versus analog, and how, where you printed it? I'll, before Brad answers that, I'll say, Amanda, um, our special collections just got Brad's newest book. So you can uh, take your students up and look at it. Um, they also got Phil Zimmerman's newest book, which is pretty amazing. So two, two books worth taking a trip to the special collections for. Um, so the, the question, what was it again? I, I, think, I think she's interested in the pre-press pre okay. process of that book and uh, how much of it was, well, and, I, and again, I think that, you know, your use of offset, you know, you sort of start with the photographic foundation, but then there's a lot of layering of mark that happens within that photographic space. And so um, what is that relationship between um, the photographic, which at this point I'm assuming is digital and um, analog in terms of maybe the mark making and uh, the pre-press work? Well, in, in some ways the photograph part isn't so different, like a digital camera, of course they're very different, a digital camera and a film camera, they're very different, but the results are very similar. And nowadays, you know, you would eventually scan a negative uh, and then print it, you know, it turns into a digital file and you would print that. Um, my pre-press process um, is varied depending on what I'm trying to do with the image. This particular book, one of the things I wanted to do was to overprint black onto already printed images and then print metallic on top of the black with various transparencies, various colors to get a certain effect. Um, and it, so those images, in fact, might not have any meaning to them, or they might have some meaning. Um, but um, what am I trying to say here? Oh, so I had a lot of press sheets from you know, 15 years of printing, 13 years of printing at the center. Uh, and I would save my press sheets from book to book. You know, just, I didn't know why, I was just saving them. And then I used those to overprint. And so the image that's being overprinted, in some places you can see it starting to come through and it begins to add meaning. Like, what is that? It's a person, you know, that's floating behind all this sort of digital imagery that is very, in some ways, very abstract. Um, so that's part of that book. Another part of the book was uh, my dad's photos, um, which I wanted to present um, which I first present in that little book, uh, the 24 page book, and they're just photos. Um, and I wanted to be as clear about that as possible. Um, but then I used those photos and did some manipulations with them just because that's my want. And um, uh, what else? Well, Brad, the other component of that book, which I kind of felt was shocking was you cutting pieces out of it. Can you talk about that? Cutting pieces out of it, you mean during the presentation? No, cutting pieces out of the book, like 
Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. You noticed that. Um, <laughs> well, it was it was like, you know, um, defacing your own work or something. Well, that was actually an editorial process. I often don't like my writing. And um, I was trying to pare it down, you know, so that the meaning came across without so much language. That really has to, and then using books that were not going to be in the edition, I would, that were already bound, I would cut out and see what it looked like when I turned the page, see what happened on the other page. And if there was a correspondence somehow or a compliment, um, then I would keep it, uh, the cutting out. I also used um, acrylic paint to paint out some of the, the text. I just can't keep my fingers off of it, kind of. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, I think that it has to be our last question as much as I don't want to conclude this really great conversation. It's also so wonderful to see so many familiar faces tonight, but that does bring us to the end. Uh, before we go, I'd like to thank a few people, including the Guild of Bookworkers, Southeast Chapter Board of Directors, and Emory Libraries for co-sponsoring this event. Thank you to the Campus and Community Relations team at Emory Libraries for arranging the event for us, and to Suzanne Sawyer for all her brainstorming sessions. Thanks so much to our wonderful moderator, Lori Spencer, and especially to Brad Freeman for sharing with us his decades of important career experiences in the world of book art. Thanks, Thank everyone. Good night. Thank Bye, Thanks, Bob. Brad. Thanks, Kim. Bye. Good night, all. See you all. Thanks, everybody. That was fun. That was great to see everyone and great talk. Thank you. <laughs>